This is something I felt was a great deception many years ago when God kind of told me it was going to be a great deception. And he told me it was going to be a deception kind of of deceptions. <laughs> you know, the ultimate deception is not knowing Yeshua is Messiah, obviously. But for the body of believers, I'm not talking about that deception. The world's under a deception. I'm talking about the body of Messiah. That's what I'm concerned about. You know, of course I'm evangelizing my heart out, and I want as many to come to the fold as possible. I want none to perish. That's just my heart. But, but this concerns the body of Messiah, and it's a very strong uh, warning. Very strong warning. Um, I want to bring up the first slide. I know you've got like 22 slides. I'm probably only going to do about 10 today, so no, don't fret. The first slide is the Abrahamic Covenant. You might wonder, why does Rabbi Greg talk about covenant so much? I want to give you um, um, a news flash that your God is a covenant-making God. I know that might come as a shock sometimes to somebody. The average believer is like, what does that mean? What does that mean? A covenant, a Brit, is an everlasting alliance for your defense, not his. There are five theocratic covenants in the Bible. Five. You should know every... That's not a lot. That's not a lot. You have an Abrahamic covenant. You have a Mosaic covenant, which is basically the giving of the law. You have an Israeli covenant at the end of Deuteronomy where God promises to never forsake them. And even though they'll go into the diaspora, he'll come back and rescue them. You have a Davidic covenant that a king will always sit on the throne. And then you have the new covenant, which is what you are. You are now under the new covenant. For you not to know where the new covenant is in the Old Testament is horrific. I, it's hard for me to believe that so many people have sat under teaching and have never been taught that God is a covenant maker. And listen, do everybody remember Promise Keepers? Okay, that was a pretty good movement. But God is the ultimate promise keeper. But you can't keep a promise that you don't make. So in order to be a promise keeper, you've got to be a promise maker. These are His covenants. You must know all five, pal. You must know where they are. You must. So this is the first covenant. This is the most important covenant. Now you might say, that can't be. The new covenant has to be most important. And that's not true. This is the most important covenant. The new covenant is most essential. You can't keep a promise that you didn't make. So this is where he's making a promise. This is the turning point for the human kingdom. This is the grand turning point for the whole human kingdom. It's in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and it says, Now Adonai said to Avram, he didn't change his, he, you know, his name yet, Get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, and away from your father's house, and go to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you are to be a blessing. Very important. Too many people are terminals for God's blessing and not channels. I'm going to go slow today because this is a very important message. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse anyone. Anyone? It could be a believer. Anyone is anyone, right? I will curse anyone who curses you. And by you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wow. That's so power-packed. Just look at one verse within this, within the three, just one, Genesis 12, 2. It says, um, do we have Genesis 12, 2? No? Okay, should have had it. I'll read it. Genesis 12, 2 says, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great, you are to be a blessing. So within that one verse, you have an individual blessing, you have a national blessing, 
and you have a universal blessing. I can't begin to tell you how many threes there are in the Bible. The first three verses of Genesis, God's number is three. That means divine perfection in gematria. He speaks in threes all over. I did a study one time because I wanted to. There's so many threes. Here's, here's a trio right here. Here's a three. We have an individual blessing, we have a national blessing, and we have a universal blessing. Very important for you to know this. Crucial. It's the foundation of your faith. Let's take a look at the individual blessing first. He says, I, that's God, will bless you, that's Abraham, and I will make your name great. He's talking about Abraham as an individual. It's just the individual Abraham. Now, regarding Abraham, he would be renowned as the father of many. He would be the father of the Jewish people. He's highly regarded in Judaism. He'd be the father of the Arabic people. He's highly regarded in Islam. And he would be the spiritual father of many people. A Christian, right? A Christian should be obedient to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I, I remember, I think, I don't know, some vacation Bible school I brought the kids to. I brought the kids to every vacation Bible school in Macon. I was trying so hard to go, hi, I'm here. I went to every church in Macon for at least one service. Every one. What? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, and I was trying to play nice. Just didn't work. I just, I worship on Saturday, so I, I don't fit into the program. I'm, I'm on the outskirts. I, you know, I tell you all the time, the difference between me and most pastors, my systematic theology is out of the book of Romans. If you're a New Covenant believer, your systematic theology should be out of the book of Romans. If you're a Christian pastor, your systematic theology should come out. You know what the difference between me and Pastor Joe is? There's some things I don't eat. He feels freedom to eat everything. And there's some feasts I observe and there's some feasts he observes. That's not worth fighting over to me. Maybe to you it is. But it's not to me. It's not. So it just didn't work out for whatever reason. But I remember at one of these vacation Bible schools, hearing that song, Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons, had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so you, and this is the part I didn't get, so let's just praise the Lord right on, what? <laughs> the song was making sense, you know, Max Lee did that, that's why I was like, I've got to get these kids out of here. My kids would come home and say, Daddy, they pray to Jesus. They pray to Jesus. I taught them, you don't pray to Jesus. They asked Jesus how to pray. What did he say? Did he say, pray to me? He said, our Father. You pray in his name, and why is that? Why do you say at the end of a prayer, in Yeshua's name? People just do that. They don't even know why they do that. Do you realize that? Christians, you're, you're confirming and affirming that if it wasn't for Yeshua, I wouldn't be able to say, our Father. It's huge. It's huge. So, the individual blessing is there. Look at Genesis 13, 2. It says, Avram become wealthy with much cattle, silver, and gold. Abraham was blessed with wealth and prosperity. However, according to your rabbi, wealth isn't always measured in dollars or shekels. That's not how I think of wealth. I'm very wealthy. I was very wealthy when Bernadette and I didn't have two nickels to rub together. I was filthy rich. The best and most enduring wealth is knowledge of the one true God and having the riches of His grace and truth through Yeshua the Messiah. That's wealth. That's wealth to me. <laughs> then we'll move on to the national blessing. It says, I will make of you, Abraham, a great nation. Okay, there's 195 nations in the world today. There's only one he's referring to. Only one. Obviously, it came as a shock to Abraham and Sarah. They were well advanced in age. At this point, her womb was a tomb. It wasn't child-rearing womb. And they didn't have any children up to now. So it would have been enough if God would have said, I'm going to give you a son. 
He said, I'm going to give you a nation. Do you know how crazy that is? Do you know what crazy talk that is? Can you imagine when Abraham came back to Sarah? They were regular people, guys. They were regular people. They didn't walk around all pious. They weren't perfect. They were just like you and me. And when he said, hey, I just spoke to the Lord. A nation is going to be birthed through us. She said, are you out your mind? You've been nipping at the bottle, A.B.? So God promised that they would be parents of an entire nation. Now, just for the record, I just have to throw this in there. Forgive me for sidetracking just for a moment. But you all need to know something. The world needs to know this, but I don't expect the world to embrace it. In an effort to erase all things Jewish, okay, the Romans changed the name of Judea. It was called Judea, but they called it, because they were Latin, Provincia Judea the province of Judah, to erase everything Jewish in 135 A.D. during the second uprising, they changed the name from Provincia Judea to Provincia Palestina. After the lifelong enemy of the Jewish people, the Philistines. Therefore, the term Palestinian is a modern political fabrication which never had any international nor academic credibility before 1967. It's made up. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. And your Bibles, you, when you look at your maps, it says Palestine. There was never, it was called Canaan, and then when Israel went in, it was called Israel. And it's been called Israel ever since. I don't care what the Romans did. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. They're Arabic people, and guess what? They're cousins of the Jews. Israel has become a nation in 13th century B.C., and the Jewish people have lived in the land for over 3,000 years. And in the immortal words of the Lord our God, he says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. The Lord has an everlasting covenant with Israel. Don't ever say he divorced Israel. Now we get to, we, we, we know the nation was birthed, right? Abraham had Isaac, the son of promise. Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had the 12 tribes, and that's Israel. Okay? I don't know what's going on today with black Jews, Puerto Rican Jews. They're Jews. The name Israel and Hebrew and Jewish are synonymous. They're Jews. I come from a long line of Jews. It's another way for the enemy to infiltrate the body and break it up. Don't buy into silly genealogies. We were warned about that, right? In Paul's letter to Timothy. Now we get to the universal blessing, and this is the most important. You are to be a blessing, Abraham. You are to be a blessing. Again, too many people want a blessing, but they don't want to pay it forward. They constantly pray for God to bless them. The reason why some people aren't blessed is because God knows they're going to be a terminal. We're channels. Beth Yeshua is a channel. Money comes in, money goes out. Money comes in, money goes out. Money comes in, money goes out. And it just keeps coming. Because we're a channel of blessing. I've been here 20 years. Do you see me with a big staff? I could have one. I could have 30 people on a staff. And then guess what? No money would go out. Because it would pay salaries. I choose not to do that. I just get them to work harder. I just make them work so hard. Roxanne does the job of three people. Three people. And I get volunteer help, right? I have 40 volunteers. They got nothing to do anyway. <laughs> you ought to be a blessing, Abraham, and by you, all the families of the earth, all the nations. When you hear the term goy or goyim, it's not derogatory. I don't know why you think it is. It means of the nations. The term Jew is not derogatory. It means of the people of Israel, the Hebrew people. 
It's just to designate, you know what I mean? And there was a time, I just got to tell you, in this country, <laughs> oh, this might not be from you, I know. I'll apologize later. Um, there was a time when people came here. America, nobody was native except for the Indian. So no matter what your background is, no matter if you came off the Mayflower, you came off the Mayflower. But hear me, they didn't call themselves Irish Americans or African Americans. You're an American. Now you have a heritage, you might be Italian, you might be Greek, that's cool. But if you want to be a Greek American, then just be a Greek and go back. It's a melting pot of people. I, you know I get this. I was raised in the projects. I don't have a racist bone in my body. When I dated black girls, they weren't black girls, they were Adrian Cherry. You follow what I'm saying? That's the way I was raised. I was raised by an, a hardcore Jewish mother. Do you know what we were taught? When, when we left Egypt, God told the Jewish people, you were once an alien in Egypt, meaning you weren't Egyptian. So now when you go to Israel and people start coming, don't treat anyone like an alien. Have you been to Israel lately? There's people from all over the world there, and they're not treated like aliens. So I wasn't raised to treat a person of a different race or creed or color like an alien. I just wasn't raised that way. You are marinated. You are marinated by your parents. And it's hard to shake. Christian, lay hands on yourself and ask the Lord to deliver you from prejudice. It's deplorable as a Christian. How could you not like a people group? And when you look at Yeshua, guess what? He doesn't fit into any group, right? They go, Israel's part of Africa. Israel's part of Europe. Israel, its own thing. Well, he was white. He was black. He was just Yeshua. What do you care what he was? He's the Savior of the world, man. Are you going to start calling yourself a white believer? A black believer? Yeah, there's black, there's black pastors that get together in town. I was invited to their meeting. I walked in. They go, what are you doing here? I said, you tell me. I got an invite. <laughs> God brought me there on purpose. And he said, well, you, I guess you could stay. And I just got up. They said, would you like to say something? I said, I sure would. What's with the black pastor meeting? Should we have the Korean pastor's meeting and everything else? Dude, don't get all white supremacist on me, though. You're in the same boat. Megan has the white church, and Megan has the black church. Megan needs to have the church. God just told me it's okay. I got a little huffy, but it's okay what I said. <laughs> because the truth is the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, so we got this universal blessing, okay? Israel would be a channel. The nation would be a channel of blessing to the entire world. Through the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, the spiritual world, not the world, the spiritual world would be blessed with three major gifts. One, monotheism. Let's hold off on that. Just go back. There you go. One is monotheism. Two is they would be entrusted with the oracles of God, meaning the Bible. They preserve the Bible for us. And most importantly, Messiah, Yeshua, a.k.a. salvation to the world. Now let's look at these individually. Let's look at monotheism first. The Jewish people gave the world monotheism it's irrefutable man I, I don't know what your attitude is and i gotta tell you something the spirit of anti-semitism runs rampant in the church some of you will raise with it some of you have it right now on you that's pathetic and demonic which is worse than pathetic matthew 22 36 38 rabbi which of the mitzvot that's commandment in hebrew in the torah first five books, the Pentateuch, is the most important. He told them they're all important. He didn't say that. There's an order of importance. There's heavy things and light things. Remember? You who teach the least of these not to obey the least. There's most and least. There definitely are. You are to love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the greatest and most important 
mitzvah. So the Pharisees heard that Yeshua had silenced their antagonists, the Sadducees. They didn't get along. They had different, believe it or not, different theologies. Not like that's prevalent today. And so they didn't like each other. But they decided to come for an interview. Well, he shut down the Sadducees. We're the Pharisees. We're the people of the land. We'll get them. So they came after him. Their spokesman was a lawyer, and they asked him to single out the greatest commandment. And he says the Shema, right? He didn't make anything new up. Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5, look. Shema Yisroel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, Israel, Adonai our God, Adonai is one. And, that's good information, but you are to love this one God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. The Shema not only encapsulates the idea of total devotion to God, but it attests to the fact that there is only one God, Elohim. That's the word they use. Now we see this from the very beginning. Look at Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's look up that word, God. We have to look it up in the Hebrew lexicon because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Elohim, the true God. The true God. Now, you need to know don't get too caught up, but Elohim is plural. It's plural. The word here is plural, grammatically speaking. Now, my question is, wait a minute, Rabbi, you said that God is one. Why is it plural? It's a great question, because Elohim is not plural in number. It's plural in intensity. The Hebrews used it expressing power and majesty rather than number. Why? Good question. The pagan world assigned a name to each of its powers in the universe. When I go to Southeast Asia, the, the armpit of the world, trust me, I've been to Shantytown all over the Caribbean and preached. I've been to Shantytown in the United States. I've been to Shantytown in all over Africa. There's no more shanty than Southeast Asia. No more. They have thousands and thousands of gods. Literally thousands some say 1.1 million but you know what i'll just go with thousands and in the pagan world what they do is they ascribe a name to each power in the universe for instance they had a god of a nile the nile river his name was hapi the god of the harvest in egypt was known as seth the god of healing was known as imhotep the god of the sun was known as ra the Torah, on the other hand, views God as the God of all creation, as the one and only true God. So, to the God of the Nile, what does God do? He sends blood. To the God of the harvest, He sends locusts. To the God of healing, He sends boils. And to the God of the sun, He sends darkness. By doing this, God was announcing to the pagan world, there ain't no God besides me. Two, the Jewish people gave us the Bible. Where do we read that? In the Old Testament, right? Nope. Nope. In the one letter that gives us our systematic New Covenant theology. Romans 3, 1, 2, it says, then what advantage has there the Jew? What is the value of being circumcised? Because only Jews were circumcised, right? Brit Milah. Paul says, oh, much in every way! Exclamation point. In the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. How could you remotely love your Bible and not love the people who preserved it? How did that happen? You all read the book of Romans. I mean, I, I know it seems a little accusatory, God forgive me, but I'm, I'm trying to think this through. I didn't know the New Testament, and I read it like you. It was just right there. It was just a no-brainer. The Jewish people have had many special privileges, but the most important to me is that they were trusted with the very words of God. The Old Testament scriptures were given to the Jewish people to write and preserve. Now the New Testament, this was written in about 48, it's one of the first books. So the New Testament's not written yet. That's okay. I don't need the New Testament. What? No, 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 let me, let me tell you what I mean. What would we do without the Old Testament? Well, for one, we would not know how it all began without the creation story in Genesis. Uh, two, we would not know the will of God for our lives without and void of the knowledge of sin without the Torah. Still in force, by the way. We would be lacking wisdom without the book of Proverbs. 
And most importantly, would not be able to recognize who the Messiah was without the 300 Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. So we kind of have all we need in a way. In a way. I'm not saying the New Testament isn't canonized. I'm not saying it's not important. It is very important. However, I'm just saying they preserved this Old Testament for us. Thousands and thousands over the centuries lost their life to preserve. When, during the Holocaust, you know what the rabbi did first? Before he took his family, he took the Torah, the Word of God. We have a Holocaust surviving Torah, certified, because the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, but the Word of the Lord is forever and you should want to thank the people who preserved it. Now, some of you are new here today, and you're like, okay, I get it. You're a rabbi. You're a Hirschberg. You don't get it. I have no preference towards my people. If I had preference towards my people, you think I'd be working in Macon? You don't think I'd be in New York City or L.A. or maybe Miami? Guys, you don't know me by now? that I don't care if a black person or a white person or an Asian or Hispanic, I don't care who gets saved. A soul's a soul to me. I don't see anything more attached to a soul. So that's just a newsflash. I'm giving you straight up Bible 101. I'm not giving you Greg Hirschberg's agenda. I don't have an agenda. My agenda is for you to walk closely with the Lord and to tell people about Him. That's the agenda if you want to know the agenda. Now three... If that's not good enough, if monotheism, oh, big deal. I would have just been cutting my kids and throwing them to the fire. No big deal. And the Bible, I just wouldn't even know God's plan of salvation. No big deal. Okay, how about Yeshua? How about number three? The Jewish people gave us Yeshua. It says John 4, 22, out of Yeshua's mouth to the woman at the well. This is out of his mouth. This isn't even an epistle of Paul's. He says, you people don't know what you're worshiping. Try that one today. You people, I'm telling you, guys, I was raised by one of the toughest guys in the world. My kids are tough. I just can't believe what a cupcake society we live in. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm scared that if we have to fight a war, we still have great warriors, but man, everything is subpar. You know, everything is subpar. You need somebody to work in a restaurant, just get a body. You need somebody in medicine. Just everything is subpar today. It's like even, even pilots now, they're grabbing pilots that 20 years ago they would have never been okay. They're grabbing them from a flight school. It's just, it's crazy. Because we just need a body. Scary stuff, man. Really scary stuff. You people don't know what you're worshiping. Who's you people? The Samaritans. And who are they? Goyim. He says, we worship, what? Who's the we? The Jews. You mean Yeshua is the we? Yes. Isn't that amazing? How you can love, that's a deception. You can love Jesus and be anti-Semitic at the same time. We worship what we do know. Because salvation comes from the Jews. What do you do with that one? Everybody loves the woman with the well story. How come, you, how come you, you didn't highlight that part? That's crazy, man. Crazy. Yeshua was condemning the Samaritan mode of worship. This is in marked contrast to those religious teachers today who say that all religions are good and they all lead to heaven at last. Many different ways. I got news for you, okay? Every time I go to Israel, I've been there 20 times, I want to hang a sign outside the tomb that says vacancy. You can't do that at Krishna's tomb. You can't do that at Buddha's tomb. You can't do that at Muhammad's tomb. You can't even do that at Mufasa's tomb. He's not the Lion King. Not all roads lead to God. Yeshua informs this woman the worship of her people was not authorized by God nor approved by Him. Rabbi, you can't say that to somebody. See, that's your problem. You're so afraid to say stuff. People respect when you're truthful.
it had been invented by man and carried on without the sanction of the Word of God. If you have a holiday that's man-made, it's carried on without the sanction of the Word of God. Stop being afraid of your wife and afraid of your church and afraid of everybody except for being afraid of God. We worship what we do know. This was not so with the worship of the Jews. God had set apart the Jewish people as His chosen people. He had given them complete instructions on the way to worship. In saying that salvation is of the Jews, Yeshua was teaching that the Jewish people were appointed to be by God to be His messengers. I've sent you, 49.6 of Isaiah, to be a light to the nations. I still believe I'm called to be a light to the nations personally. And it was to them that the Scriptures had been given also. Also, it was through the Jewish nation that Messiah was given. Period. End of story. And if you're not sure of it, let me give you a few verses. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Not much. Ephesians is all about the body of Messiah. Colossians is all about the head. There's a different reason for the letter was written. Ephesians is all about unity. Unity between Jew and Gentile. Unity between husband and wife. Unity, unity, unity. And he's the head and we're the body. And Paul is writing a letter to the body. And he says, therefore, remember your former state, you Gentiles. What's going on? You Gentiles? You people of the nations. You non-biological Jews. It's, you're, no, you're nothing less. There's no Jew or Gentile. You're not less. This is for teaching purposes and for identification purposes. He says, you Gentiles birth called the uncircumcised by those who merely because of an operation in their flesh. I'm not Jewish because my name is Hirschberg and I'm not Jewish because I had my Brit Milan on the eighth day. I'm Jewish because I'm a praiser of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, at that time, you had no Messiah. You were estranged from the national life of Israel. Hear that. You were estranged from the national life of Israel. You've got to see what this says. You can't run through this quick, guys. You'll miss the whole message. It says you are foreigners to the covenants. Remember when I told you the covenants? How important the covenants are? They're all over the New Testament. So how you miss it, I don't know. Embodying God's promise. You are in this world without hope and without God. Here comes the big but. But now, you who were once far off have been brought near through the shedding of Messiah's blood. Now here's my question. You're brought to the national life of Israel. Now forgive me, I've been to Puerto Rico many times. I have some Puerto Ricans in this audience. Okay, you are part of the Commonwealth of America, sir. Which means you can't just do your little Puerto Rican thing and just take from America. You've got to give to America, too, if you want to be part of the Commonwealth. So you Gentiles, if you want to be part of the Commonwealth of Israel and brag about your grafting, then, then give, man. Just don't take the promises. And by giving, I mean if you're part of the national life, then this this country has feasts, according to the Bible. Now, be careful. Hold on. Some of you are way too froggy. That's, that's what I tell people. First of all, you don't tell it right. You tell it accusatory. You don't underwrite it with love. It's a mean spirit. It's that Hebrew root spirit. Like, let's attack the church. We don't evangelize anymore. Our job is to attack the church. Guys, I don't attack. I got some of my best friends are past in the church, and they dance circles around you when it comes to doing things for God. So relax. Don't pat yourself on the back because you don't eat pork and you celebrate Rosh Hashanah. It's nothing to write home about. However, if you're grafted in, what are you grafted into? Clearly, the Jews weren't grafted out. This is straight up Christianity 101. This is kindergarten Christianity, what I'm presenting to you. Kindergarten. This is not advanced by no means. Therefore, based on Ephesians, the nations or the people of the nations do not replace Israel. So replacement theology is clearly a demonic doctrine. They don't improve Israel. You don't improve Israel. Are you the new improved believer? Watch us sin. We do it better. 
you don't change Israel. Rather, upon faith in Jesus, the people of the nations enlarge Israel. Therein lies the term grafted in. In other words, when a Gentile comes to faith, they don't replace the remnant, they join the remnant. Now, I should probably stop here. Um, I want to tell you one thing that I'm going to get much more involved in, deeper into Romans 11, because it's a chapter that like just is hopped over. It's like you finish Romans 10, and you just go, you know, therefore present yourself a living sacrifice. Or you finish Romans 8, that's better. There's no condemnation for those in Messiah Yeshua. Therefore present you. What happened to 9, 10, 11? Nobody teaches on it. 9, Israel's past. Romans 10, Israel's present. Romans 11, Israel's future. You just hop over. No condemnation. Hallelujah. What do I do? Present yourself a living sacrifice. What happened to all that stuff? How do you just rip those things off? So, you can see by this little presentation I made, this nothing, non-impressive presentation, by all regard, how the Jewish people were chosen by God to be His messengers about the one true God and about Messiah, the Savior of the world. But what about the modern day blessing that Israel has put forth? Let me just go over a couple and then we'll get out of here, okay? The Nobel Prize is an annual international award bestowed by the Scandinavian committees in recognition of the cultural and scientific advances, and this began in 1895 up to the present time. Israel, Jewish people, are less than two-tenths of one percent of the world's population. I don't know if you can appreciate that. That means that 99.8 percent of the world's population is non-Jewish. That's crazy. Jews aren't 10 percent, 5 percent, not even a percent, not even a half a percent. There's 8 billion people in the world, literally. 8 billion people. There's maybe 14 million Jews, tops. And that's a lot of people that claim Judaism. You know, I saw my grandma eat matzah. That doesn't make you a Jew. <laughs> now, with that being said, let me go over the Nobel Prize winners over the years. In chemistry, Israel has had 31 winners. That's 20% of the world's total. Less than two-tenths of 1%. In economics... They go, the Jews run the, the economy. Guy, if the Jew ran the economy, we wouldn't be in trillion dollars of debt. <laughs> a bunch of goys ran the economy, okay? I bought two little houses. I waited until I had the money. I really believe that the borrower is a, a slave to the lender. No, if the Jews ran the economy, it wouldn't be in this condition. 28 prize winners, that's 42% of the world's total. Literature, 13 prize winners, that's 13% of the world's total. Peace, nine prize winners, that's 10% of the world's total. Physics, 47 prize winners, that's 26% of the world's total. And physiology and medicine, 53 prize winners, that's 28% of the world's total. The Jewish people have been sickly blessed by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with crazy knowledge. Iran's supreme leader, you're familiar that Iran is not run by the president. It's run by the religious leader. His name is Grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and he urged the Muslim people recently to boycott anything and everything that originates with the Jewish people. Okay. In response to this, a man by the name of Maya Trankman, a pharmacist, Jewish guy, out of the kindness of his heart, Maxie, he's offered to assist the Muslims in their boycott. Let me read to you the following. A Muslim who has heart disease must not use digitalis. A discovery by a Jew, Dr. Ludwig Traub. Should he suffer with a toothache, I had one this week, he must not use Novocaine. A discovery of a Jew, Alfred Einhorn. If a Muslim has diabetes, he must not use insulin. How's that going to work? 
the result of Dr. Oscar Minkowski, a Jew. A Muslim who has syphilis must be not cured by the salvarsin discovered by a Jew, Dr. Paul Ehrlich. He should not even try to find out whether he has syphilis because the Wasserman test was the discovery of a Jew bacteriologist, August Wasserman. Muslims with convulsions must put up with them because it was a Jew, pharmacologist Oscar Liebrich, who proposed the use of chloral hydrate to treat them. Should a Muslim child get diphtheria, he must refrain from the Schick reaction, which was invented by a Jew, Dr. Bella Schick. They should continue to die or remain crippled by infantile paralysis because the discoverer of the anti-polio vaccine was a Jew, Dr. Jonas Salk. Muslims must refuse the use of strept to mycin and continue to die of tuberculosis because a Jew, Zalman Waxman, invented the wonder drug against this killing disease. A Muslim with cardiac arrhythmia must not use a defibrillator discovered by a Jew, Dr. Albert Hyman. Muslim doctors must discard all discoveries and improvements by dermatologist Dr. Judah Zen Benedict or by the pulmonary specialist Dr. Joel Frankel and the many other world-renowned Jewish scientists and medical experts such as Andrew Shalley in endocrinology, Baruch Bloomberg in epidemiology, Bernard Katz in neuromuscular transmission, or Ellie Menchinoff in infectious diseases. So go ahead and boycott anything and everything Jewish, but you're going to be pretty sick. Now, allow Greg Hirschberg to add something to his letter. If you're a Muslim boycotting everything Jewish, then you must not use your mobile phone or your computer to notify other Muslims about the boycott, because the mobile phone was invented by Motorola's Israel research team, and the computer was first designed by a Jew, Evelyn Berezin, in 1957. In fact, you can't even write about it to other Muslims, because the ballpoint pen was invented by a Jew, Laszlo Biro, and last but not least, all Muslims should never wear blue jeans because blue jeans was first manufactured by a Jew named Levi Strauss. <laughs> so I'll end with a question for you. I have a question, and I think that all believers should ask this question, and we'll go over it next week. Are there any inherent risks with being ambivalent towards Israel and the Jewish people? In other words... Rabbi, what if I remain neutral and just stay on the sidelines when it comes to Israel and the Jewish people? I'm not against them, but at the same time, I'm not necessarily for them. Well, guys, there's tremendous risk, and this is the deception that's coming on the world of believers. The Abrahamic covenant has totally influenced the course of human history. It was the watershed moment when God announced his intention to save the world. However, the blessed, cursed part of the covenant has been much overlooked and must be dealt with, especially in these last days of ours. Do you remember the warnings Yeshua gave regarding the end days in Matthew 24, 25? He spoke of the wise and foolish servants. He spoke of the wise and foolish virgins. And he spoke of the wise and foolish nations. It is important to note that there are three classes of people in Matthew 25 that he refers to. There are sheep, there are goats, and then there's Yeshua's brethren. Hear me. The first two classes over whom Messiah sits in judgment are Gentiles living during the tribulation. Some will go to the right as sheep, some will go to the left as goats. The third class is Yeshua's faithful brethren who refuse to deny his name during the tribulation. When Yeshua teaches what you did for the least of my brethren, you did unto me, he is speaking specifically of how you, as a Christian, deal with the Jews. Look the word up. It's not the word for brethren like we have here. Alde fetes, it's the word alde fas, and it means people from the same biology. In other words, he's warning everybody who are going to say to him, when did we see you naked? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you imprisoned? Remember the Holocaust? They were naked. They were thirsty. They were hungry. And they were imprisoned. 
So the warning from Jesus' mouth is, what you don't do for the least of those Jewish people, you don't do to me. That is a slap of truth that Satan has masked the body of Messiah with. They do not hear this. You hear this here. Get the word out. You can actually love Jesus with all your heart and hold on to your Bible and hold it on and yet be totally ambivalent towards the Jewish people. And it's not going to be a good message you're going to hear at the end of it. Let's stand up together. The Scriptures already went out. I didn't want to really send them out, but obviously God did. So you have them. There's only 10 screens. I'm sure at some point in between your busy schedule this week, with everything you got going on, you might be able to just carve out maybe an hour. You know what I mean? Just an hour. Where you read the Scriptures and you, you maybe study them a little bit. So you come in here already knowing you might be able to tell me stuff next week. But the message next week is the quintessential message from Romans 11 that refutes every replacement theological doctrine there is out there. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Your Elder Noi Ponovelecha, Behunecha, Yesa Adonoi Ponovelecha, the Assemblech, Shalom. I love you, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>